As the clouds of war gathered over Europe and Asia in the late 1930s, American military planners were facing a problem. While the United States' primary four-engine bomber, the B-17 Flying Fortress, was a reliable workhorse, it would never have the range or power to carry a full payload non-stop across the Pacific or the Atlantic. Enter the world's first super bomber, the B-29 Super Fortress. Designed to go faster and higher than any bomber before it, the B-29 would redefine the limits of aerial warfare. With the dubious honour of being history's deadliest bomber and the only aircraft to drop a nuclear weapon in combat, the B-29 is arguably the most important and controversial aircraft in human history. This is the B-29 Super Fortress. Controversy swirled around the B-29 long before it took its first flight in 1942. The US Army Air Force's demands pushed designers and engineers to the limit. They wanted a super bomber that could deliver 20,000 pounds of bombs to a target over 2,500 miles away. The only way to achieve this would be to fly at higher altitudes where the air was thinner, but that required a pressurised aircraft. While pressurised cabins had been developed for airliners, no one had ever designed a pressurised bomber. But aircraft manufacturer Boeing had a head start. The company had already developed a pressurised cabin for its 307 Stratoliner passenger plane, and this gave them the edge over the competition. In 1940, Boeing was awarded the contract to build a prototype, and work began on the XB-29. The development of the new super bomber would become the most expensive project of the entire war. Totaling $3 billion, equivalent to $49 billion today, the costs of design and production exceeded even the Manhattan Project by $1 billion. Each B-29 cost approximately half a million dollars to build, over double the cost of a B-17. Despite their huge price tag, the US Army Air Force ordered 250 B-29s months before it had even taken its first flight. So what made this new super bomber so special? It was a big aeroplane, a big, big, very impressive aeroplane. Like the typical, it was just a, an upgraded fortress, you know, the fortress, but bigger, much bigger. But they certainly worked very well. The most distinctive feature of the B-29 is its shape. Unlike the Art Deco-inspired B-17, with its smooth curves and jutting lines, the B-29 is cylindrical and sleek, right down to its flush rivets. This was for a good reason. A circular cockpit was easy to pressurise, while a sleek fuselage and long wing improved aerodynamics. This revolutionary airframe housed an innovative new crew setup. Six crew members were located in the forward pressurised compartment, including the flight engineer, a new full-time position responsible for ensuring that all the flight systems were in working condition. A pressurised tunnel behind the cockpit provided access to the aft pressurised compartment. This is where the B-29's computerised fire control system was located. Traditional manned turrets were not suitable for high altitude missions carried out by B-29s, so a remote control system was introduced. Four turrets, two on top of the fuselage and two underneath, were controlled from sighting stations inside the pressurised compartments. Sitting on an elevated seat, nicknamed the Barber's Chair, the central fire control gunner could take control of any of the aircraft's gun positions remotely. The B-29 was the first bomber to use radar as standard equipment, and it proved to be vital in improving the accuracy of bombing at night and in heavy cloud cover. The radar antenna was in the radome at the bottom of the aircraft. This equipment was so sensitive that the radome was censored in official photographs of the aircraft. But the B-29's real sting was its bomb load, up to 9,000 kilograms worth, which was housed in two bomb bays. The release of bombs would alternate between the two bomb bays to maintain aircraft stability. Packed with so many innovative new features, it's no surprise that the B-29 was the heaviest aircraft of its day. To get it off the ground, Boeing fitted the B-29 with four Wright R-3350 duplex cyclone radial engines. These supercharged 23,200 HP engines were the most powerful piston engines in production, but they were notorious for overheating with devastating consequences. On one of its first test flights, the engine of an XB-29 caught fire and the plane crashed into a factory in Seattle, killing all 11 crew members and 20 factory workers. It was an inauspicious start for the career of this super bomber, and things weren't going to get any easier. The B-29 was central to US strategy in the Pacific as a high altitude bomber. However, operating from airfields in China and India was a logistical nightmare, with fuel and ordnance having to be flown over the perilous Himalayas. 
A solution was found on the remote Marinaras Islands, where US Marines had just fought a brutal campaign to capture key landing strips. As well as placing US planes closer to the Japanese home islands, the airfields were on a direct supply line from the United States by ship. On November 24, Marianas-based B-29s flew their first mission against the Japanese home islands when 88 unescorted planes bombed Tokyo, the first attacks on the Japanese capital since the infamous 1942 Doolittle Raid. This strategy of high-level bombing continued until early 1945, but results were less than impressive. B-29s turned back in droves due to recurring mechanical failures. Worse still, no one had accounted for the strong, unpredictable winds that are found at high altitudes over Japan. Now identified as jet streams, these gusts could reach up to 200 miles per hour, making precision bombing impossible. Fooled by winds, US planners hoped to harness the power of a different element of nature, fire. Under the leadership of General Curtis LeMay, a strategy of low-level nighttime incendiary bombing was deployed to devastate Japan's cottage industries. This was a controversial move. Most Japanese houses were constructed of wood and bamboo, and LeMay knew that firebombing would lead to huge civilian losses. But with the B-29 yet to prove itself effectively in combat, and pressure increasing to deliver a knockout blow to Japan, there seemed to be little choice. B-29s were stripped of their guns to allow for M-69 incendiary bombs, and in some cases napalm bombs, to be loaded. The climax of these incendiary attacks came on the night of the 9th to the 10th of March, when 279 B-29s firebombed Tokyo. It lasted for two hours. That was a terrible night. March 10th. And I don't know how I lived, but you could feel the heat. And I heard people screaming, probably mothers and children trying to get into the moat. I was right across from the Emperor's Palace and they were trying to get into the water to avoid the heat. The individual fires caused by the bombs joined together to create a blazing inferno. When it was over, 16 square miles of the center of Tokyo had gone up in flames and nearly 100,000 people had been killed. More than the estimated casualties of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. A mere 14 B-29s were lost in the raid. The B-29 had defied its critics, but at what cost? Grieving Japanese civilians and military personnel had little sympathy for the B-29 crews that were forced to bail out. Many were executed immediately, while others were submitted to extreme forms of torture. I was soon overrun, and I was stoned and beaten with clubs and bars, iron bars, and dragged. You, you, you get a pretty good working over, but I think before we formed judgment, but if somebody had bombed our city here and the enemy is on the ground, the same thing would have happened. I was taken on a truck. I didn't know where I was going. I was blindfolded all of the time that I was in Japan. Interrogations were brutal, I won't go into detail. They hated us B-29ers, with cause. The incendiary raids had a devastating effect on Japan, and yet the war still raged on. Allied planners believed that the only way to secure an unconditional Japanese surrender was by unleashing a new, unprecedented weapon, an atomic bomb. As early as 1943, it was decided that the B-29 was the only airframe in the US inventory capable of carrying out the mission, despite the aircraft still being incomplete at that point. Extensive modifications were made to allow a B-29 to carry and drop the bomb and survive the resulting shockwave and radiation. These modified B-29s were known as the Silver Plate Fleet after the project's codename. A Silver Plate B-29 named Enola Gay took off from the Marianas at 2.45 a.m. on August 6, 1945. An atomic bomb was dropped at 8.15 a.m. and exploded about 2,000 feet above the city. The blast destroyed four square miles and killed an estimated 70,000 people. 
Three days later, a second B-29 dropped a plutonium bomb, nicknamed Batman, on the Japanese city of Nagasaki, killing an estimated 40,000 people. My aircraft, there were three taking part. Lead aircraft carrying the bomb, one carrying scientific monitoring instruments, and the third carrying cameras, and I was in the third. The flash just lit the cockpit. The moment I first saw it, it was like a ball of fire. But the fire rapidly died down and became a, a churning, boiling, bubbling cloud, getting larger and larger and rocketing upwards. And I would think that uh, within a two or three minutes, it was at 60,000 feet. On the 15th of August, Japan surrendered and the B-29 would go down in infamy for its role in ending the war and heralding the atomic age. Production of the B-29 was phased out after the Second World War, with the last example completed by Boeing's Renton factory on the 28th of May 1946. But unlike many of its wartime contemporaries, the B-29 wasn't destined for the scrap heap. In fact, the airframe played an important role as the US's primary nuclear deterrent in the immediate post-war years. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, engineers were experimenting with their own version of the B-29, the Tupolev Tu-4. In the summer of 1944, three B-29s made emergency landings in Russia and were swiftly whisked away to a facility in Moscow. With these three aircrafts, Soviet engineers began one of the most complex and audacious reverse engineering projects ever. The Finnish bomber was almost identical to the B-29. However, when British air crews came face to face with a B-29, they were less impressed than their Soviet counterparts. In the early 1950s, the RAF received 87 B-29s from the United States, which they renamed the Washington. The Americans said, here, you've got an aircraft at 40,000 feet, drop a pea in a barrel. Well, I think in England, if we got up to 25,000, we were about its upper limit. That didn't impress us at all. And their so-called Norden bombsite was terrible compared with our own the bomb site and we used in the lakes even, yeah. Built in May 1945, this superfortress, 4461748, never saw combat during the Second World War. With the outbreak of the Korean War, however, in 1950, it was taken out of storage and assigned to the 307th Bomb Group. Soon adorned with a Razorback 4 motif and the name It's Hawk Wild, the bomber took part in operations over North Korea against communications and supply centers. However, the B-29 was an easy target for jet engine MiGs and losses were high. With the arrival of the Convair B-36 and subsequently the B-52 Stratofortress, the B-29's days were numbered. The B-29 can be seen as the bridge between the pistoned engine bombers of the Second World War and the nuclear-enabled aircraft of the Cold War period. In a way, its state-of-the-art equipment hindered it in its primary role as a high-altitude bomber while the hands of progress meant that it had soon been overtaken by the time of the Korean War. The B-29 was an expensive gamble that eventually paid off for the US, giving them the tool to end the war with Japan. However, it's the moral implications of this choice that will immortalize the B-29 as the plane that redefined history. <laughs>